Hello everyone, today we tackle a video that was recently put on the YouTube channel of the Discovery Institute wherein they attempt to discredit homology as evidence of evolution. That's not all, the narrator and animator of this video is none other than our old friend Long Story Short. Hmm, this should be interesting. So let's jump right in. <laughs> If you don't remember, Long Story Short made a video on his own channel about the Cambrian Explosion wherein he tried to argue that it was a problem for Darwin and still a problem for evolution today. We've addressed this in a two-part series on Darwin's confidence, links in the down part. This led to a discussion between us on YouTube wherein we also discussed a bit about homology, so let's see what he has learned since then. Careful observers for a long time have noticed that very different creatures have very similar bits. These sorts of ideas date all the way back to Aristotle. If we fast forward to the 1800s, anatomist Sir Richard Owen coined a term for these observations, homology. Take a look at this guy. He's got an arm that starts with one bone, followed by two bones, and then lots of tiny bones for the wrist and fingers and whatnot. Great for grabbing stuff and high-fiving. Whales and dogs have basically the same structure, but they're not so good at those things. Why in the world would that be the case? Before Darwin, biologists chalked this up to common design. Just like a painter has a particular style and reuses similar colors or themes that he likes across a lot of his work, so the thinking went, similarities in animal design pointed to a common designer. A few years later, along comes Darwin and he figured that these structural similarities were important evidence for his theory of evolution. So, rather than a common designer, he instead credited common ancestry. But which is the proper explanation for these obvious similarities? So far, so good. I would add that the significance of homology with respect to evolution and common ancestry isn't merely noticing some similarities between different organisms. The differences also matter. In the common example that LSS uses, we can see many differences between tetrapod limbs. For example, in birds, the digits, carpals, and metacarpals are fused, forming the carpometacarpus. This is a trait that is only shared by birds. When we compare the limb structure of tetrapods with the appendages of other vertebrates, we see what makes the structure of tetrapod limbs unique. The flippers of whales and sharks look similar on the outside and they perform similar tasks, but the internal structures are very different, that of whales being more similar to us than to sharks. This is just one reason how we know that whales are tetrapods. In fact, as far back as the late 1800s, naturalists like Ernst Haeckel recognized that whales are closely related to hooved mammals. So, we have many similarities and differences among different organisms, but what makes them relevant is their pattern among living things. Humans have noticed this for ages, but Carolus Linnaeus was the first to construct a method of classification to describe this observation. He didn't find that animals were classified as distinct kinds, instead they formed a nested hierarchy. No one knew why life was organized this way. This is where Darwin came in. The distribution of organismal traits forming a nested hierarchy, wherein each group has its own unique set of traits that are shared by its members, is exactly what is expected from evolution and common ancestry. This is why Darwin used these traits that were labeled homologous as evidence for common descent. Basically, with his method of taxonomy, Linnaeus constructed an evolutionary tree without even knowing what it was. Please note the emphasis on the nested hierarchical pattern of these traits, which will become important later on. Alright, LSS was about to answer what the proper explanation for homology is. Let's see what he has to say. Interbiologist Tim Barra. Guys, 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 I've got a really good illustration. It'll totally put this question to bed. If you look at a 1953 Corvette and compare it to the latest model, only the most general resemblances are evident. But if you compare a 53 and 54 side by side and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. The evidence is so solid and comprehensive that it can't be denied by reasonable people. In using this analogy, Dr. Barra actually demonstrates precisely the opposite of what he intended. Here's why. A succession of even very similar forms doesn't demand common descent. It could, in this case it does, instead point to a common designer. These guys, the engineers at Chevy. 
For a start, the way LSS frames Dr. Barra's analogy is quite misleading, making it seem as though the Corvette analogy was specifically intended as an argument for why homology is best explained by common descent, and not by common design. Instead, Barra used it in his 1990 book to get across the idea of how successive, slightly different forms, as seen in the fossil record of human evolution, eventually lead to quite different appearances. If you compare a 1953 Corvette to the latest model, then there will be a huge number of differences. But if you compare a 1953 model to a 1954 model, then the 1954 model to a 1955 model, and so on, you'd see a much more gradual change in features as a result of descent with modification, which is what we see in the hominid fossil record. That was the point of the analogy to convey the concept of a gradual succession towards increasingly different forms, he made it more easily understandable for the layman by giving a more familiar example. It wasn't presented to explain the evidence and certainly not presented as evidence for common descent over design. Not even remotely. LSS says the analogy shows successive similar forms don't require biological descent as an explanation because designers can also do this as they did with the Corvettes. Well, of course. No one has ever argued that descent with modification is the only possible explanation for successively different forms. The point is that it's the best explanation, better than common design, as LSS is about to demonstrate. Intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want, just like I use the same password FluffyBunny123 for everything I do online. Quote, intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want, close quote. Exactly. So why would the agent follow the pattern expected by common descent as opposed to literally any other pattern? Why not reuse the lungs of birds in bats? Why not give sharks a few octopus tentacles or whale flippers? How about a reptile with eight legs like a spider? We don't see this kind of absurd mosaicism in nature. Common design and common descent give very different explanations for why this is so. Common descent obviously explains it by saying that as successive forms or slightly modified versions of their ancestors, complex traits can't simply jump around the tree of life. Instead, they fall into a nested hierarchy. There's that word again. Common design, on the other hand, can only say, the designer just decided to do it that way for some reason. As Richard Owen put it, quote, On the ordinary view of the independent creation of each being, we can only say that so it is that it has so pleased the creator to construct each animal and plant." Close quote. The former is a testable hypothesis, while the latter is merely ad hoc. So the question remains open, is homology due to common design or common descent? Because the argument was so central to Darwin's case, his followers eliminated the question by simply redefining the word from simple similarity to meaning similarity due to common ancestry. They baked Darwinism into the definition of the word. Homology now typically means similarity due to common ancestry. It's a clever way to end an argument if you can get away with it, but for anybody paying attention, it's a baldly circular one. Common ancestry because common ancestry. LSS makes it sound like Darwinist redefined homology as similarity due to common ancestry as a way to win the argument that homology was the result of common descent. But, in reality, it was defined this way after the evidence for common descent was already clear, i.e. the aforementioned nested hierarchical distribution of these traits. Only then was homology defined to make it clear that the word homology should only refer to similarities that can be demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt to have resulted from common ancestry, as opposed to those resulting from convergent evolution, in which case it's called a homoplasy. Changing the usages of our terms doesn't happen to just evolution. According to Isaac Newton's theory of gravitation, gravity was defined as a force field that objects with mass produced, which caused them to attract each other. With the improvements made by the theory of relativity, gravity is now defined as the curvature of space-time caused by energy or mass, being the same thing, which in turn causes time dilation, gravity waves, gravitational lensing, along with the familiar phenomenon of attraction between massive objects. Albert Einstein didn't redefine gravity to win the argument against Newton. The definition changed along with our understanding. Likewise, we didn't redefine the word atom from its original meaning, being uncuttable, in order to make a circular argument for the existence of subatomic particles. Once we knew that atoms were made of smaller parts, we changed our perception of atoms, and thereby the definition of that label. This is done on the basis of evidence, 
not semantic tricks. We gotta flag all the play, circular reasoning, illegal use of logic, five yard penalty, repeat the fourth grade. Oh come on, no serious biologist could possibly make that mistake. Nobody defines homology that way and then uses it as evidence for evolution. LSS has a person saying no one could make the mistake of saying homology is similarity due to common ancestry, and then uses it as evidence of evolution while citing the Talk Origins page that debunks his argument in the bottom left of the screen. Come on, people couldn't possibly be that No. The circular argumentation is still regularly used in high school, even college level textbooks, and many a Hello everyone YouTube video. The surprising thing is that many otherwise very smart people didn't realize this. The NCSE agrees that sometimes introductory textbooks explain the concepts inadequately due to limited space and recommends correcting this. As they say, quote, The biggest flaw in textbook descriptions of homology is that they, like Wells, tend to confuse the definition of homology with the diagnosis of homologous features. Textbooks need to state explicitly that homologies are similarities seen in the biological world that are best explained as being due to common descent. They should then explain how homologous structures are diagnosed by their similar structure and position, biochemical basis, developmental path, and so on. A more detailed and lengthened discussion would help to remove the appearance of circularity caused by oversimplified descriptions. Finally, adding the notions of multiple layers of homology from genetics and developmental biology would better show students just how different lines of evidence converge to support homologies and phylogenies, close quote. Indeed, not all textbooks make this mistake. For example, the fifth edition of Pearson's Evolutionary Analysis says on page 71, quote, we can use homologous traits shared among species to test Darwin's hypothesis of common ancestry. We will show the logic using evolutionary novelties shared among imaginary snail species derived with modification from a single lineage." Close quote. In the hypothetical example given in this figure, we see how evolution and several rounds of speciation would produce species whose traits are shared in a nested pattern, because each trait evolved in a common ancestor of some, but not all of these snails. Further on, the textbook reads, Quote, our hypothetical snail demonstrates that the theory of common descent with modification from common ancestors makes a prediction. Extant organisms should share nested sets of novel traits, and indeed they do. For example, humans are nested within the apes, a group of species that have large brains and no tails. The apes, in turn, are nested within the primates, which have grasping hands and feet with flat nails instead of claws. The primates are nested within the mammals, defined by hair and feeding milk to their young. The mammals are nested within the tetrapods, the tetrapods within the vertebrates, and so on. The nested pattern of traits shared among extant species thus confirms the prediction of Darwin's theory, close quote. This isn't circular reasoning. The most egregious thing about this segment is when LSS quotes one line from Talk Origins at the bottom left of the screen. To mine this line out of context, LSS misrepresents Talk Origins as if they were claiming that nobody would make this mistake. That's not what it says. After that first line, it continues on explaining the exact same thing that I just did, which debunks their whole argument. And it isn't that LSS just stopped reading after the first line. During our one-on-one -on -one discussion, I actually read this very Talk Origins page to him, so he knows about it, which means he deliberately chose to omit the very rebuttal to their argument on purpose. However, more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is. The claim of LSS is that more and more people are seeing the problem, present tense. Yet, the papers he shows on screen as examples are actually from 1947 and 1985. It's true that there have been opponents to this redefinition in the past, but not on the simplistic and misleading grounds that LSS presents in this video. So what are the options in trying to solve this problem and escape the vicious circularity? Seeing their success at redefining homology, some tried to redefine circular reasoning too. Huh, all right, let's, let's see here. Whoa, 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 it's not circular reasoning. Let's call it uh, reciprocal illumination. Fancying up a term doesn't really change the argument. LSS claims Hennig simply redefined circular reasoning as reciprocal illumination, which is extremely misleading. Hennig, 1966, argued that the relationship between homology and ancestry 
isn't any more logically circular than the rest of science, where hypotheses are constantly tested against the larger theory every time when new data is available. Hypotheses are generated on data and then compared to further data. The key point is the consilience between the parts and the whole that gets built up. As Hennig explains in his book Phylogenetic Systematics, quote, In reality, phylogenetic systematics uses a method known and employed in all sciences, which in the humanities is called the, the method of reciprocal illumination, checking, correcting, and rechecking of the Anglo-Saxon authors, close quote. Other attempts were made to escape the circularity, but they had to give up on homology as evidence. And instead, they looked to other lines of evidence for common ancestry, namely DNA. Eyeballing bones was a bit subjective anyway. It's kind of like trying to guess what someone's thinking by looking at their face. Did, did he really just imply that comparative morphology when it comes to the skeleton is all about eyeballing bones? Does he really think we are just making a guess when we call a bone a humerus, even if it could also easily be a femur? I mean, maybe he can't tell the difference, and perhaps he thinks that, by extension, nobody can, and thus it's all eyeballing, but that's ridiculous. Also, that NCSE, quote, didn't say that homology has to be given up as evidence for common descent. They effectively say the same thing as talk origins. Homology isn't evidence for common descent in the sense that we simply assert traits X, Y, and Z are homologous, therefore common descent. We first infer common ancestry based on many lines of data and determine whether a particular shared trait is due to common descent or not. Only then is the homology label applied. The consistency of the evidence leading to the label is what is being referred to when we say homology is evidence of common ancestry. If Darwinism is true, we should be able to construct a reasonably consistent family tree pretty much no matter what genes we compare. But that's far from the case. In reality, Using genes like cytochrome C as evidence for common ancestry is just a good example of molecular cherry picking. Depending on what genes are used, biologists will come up with wildly different ancestry and contradictory trees of life. Comparing different animals cytochrome B genes, scientists found cats and whales cavorting in the primate club, kicking poor little cute little tarsiers out into the cold, frogs and birds and fish carrying on together in their own strange little group, and even sea urchins masquerading as chordates. It's madness! Molecular evidence, as it turns out, does very little to support homology. It's basically a big, wet blanket for the hopeful biologists who study the field. First, it's clear that he doesn't read his own citations. From citing the third paper, which is a news article from 1999, he claimed that from comparing the cytochrome B gene, we got a primate tree that includes cats and whales but excludes tarsiers, and one tree that had frogs, fish, and birds in one group, and sea urchins as chordates. However, only the former tree was constructed using cytochrome B, while the latter was constructed from all mitochondrial protein coding genes. And that's clear when you read the parts that he highlights, or just the caption of the figure alone. Furthermore, he said that, quote, if Darwinism is true, we should be able to construct reasonably consistent family trees pretty much no matter what genes we compare, but that's far from the case. The words reasonably consistent and pretty much no matter are doing some heavy lifting here. Evolution certainly doesn't predict that every single phylogenetic tree inferred from every single individual gene will give the exact same result. So contrasting one correct result, cytochrome C, against one incorrect result, cytochrome B, doesn't exactly do the subject justice. It reminds me of when news shows present a balanced discussion between one expert and one crackpot. A 50-50 split is not representative of reality. Evolution predicts that neutrally evolving DNA sequences will record common ancestry, not necessarily individual genes. Genes are functional sequences by definition, and over the course of evolution, selection can act on them, which disrupts the true phylogenetic signal. There are also other biological phenomena that are known to disrupt phylogenetic trees, like horizontal gene transfer, and incomplete lineage sorting. The second paper by Michael Lynch, where he quotes him on the fact that the phylogenetic relationships of animal phyla has been an elusive problem, also states, quote, Given the substantial evolutionary time separating the animal phyla, it is not surprising that single gene analyses yield such discordant results. Under such circumstances, the statistical noise associated with the substitution process leads to a high probability that phylogenetic analyses based on different molecules will yield different topologies. 
so that inferences based on single genes can potentially be very misleading, leaving aside for now the additional problem of orthology, close quote. His own citations refute his claim that from Darwinism we should expect consistent family trees no matter what gene we compare. Not to mention that most of his citations are grossly outdated. The previous is from 1998. His fourth citation, Congruence Between Molecular and Morphological Phylogenies, is from November 1993, almost 27 years ago. As the paper itself says, quote, Molecular phylogenetics is still in its infancy generally with little to offer beyond trees, often mutually contradictory, based on partial rRNA sequences. We believe that these problems are soluble by the molecular approach, but that the effort necessary to achieve decisive solutions will be comparable to that put into the hominids, with the added dimension of sampling problems. Close quote. A lot has happened since then. We now have a lot more data, and as stated previously, we also know about horizontal gene transfer and incomplete lineage sorting. In fact, the first paper from 2009, the most recent one that he showcased, titled Gene Tree Discordance, Phylogenetic Inference and the Multispecies Coalescent, is all about incomplete lineage sorting. It also explains how this can be taken into account when trying to resolve close species relationships. Yes, close species relationships. Creationists going on about their created kinds wouldn't have a problem with these. Even so, evolutionists are fully aware of incomplete lineage sorting, which is just one reason why gene trees don't always correspond to the species tree. We know these phenomena are real because we can observe them today, so it's not unexpected or some kind of evidence against common ancestry when we see what appear to be their effects. Biology is messy, and no one is so naive as to expect the job of reconstructing accurate phylogenies to be easy, except creationists apparently. It's also worth noting that we shouldn't just be considering whether any given tree is correct or incorrect. We should consider how close or far away from being correct it is. If 10 different trees are all 10% incorrect in different ways, then that's very different from 10 trees all being 100% incorrect. There will always be some statistical variation to account for. This is a hugely complicated subject with a massive body of literature. But LSS doesn't discuss any of it. He points to a single instance of incongruence and then hand waves about how molecular phylogenetics is all basically useless. However, when we look up the original 1998 paper by Andrews et al., from which the weird primate tree based on cytochrome B claim comes from, we can see the figure that includes the statistical certainty for each branch. This is the maximum likelihood tree based on 10 mammalian cytochrome B nucleotide sequences. Some branches show high certainty, such as the one given for humans, colobus monkeys, and squirrel monkeys, has a near 100% likelihood, and the one for the bush baby and loris has an 84.9% likelihood. Both of these relationships match the accepted phylogeny. However, for the other relationships that deviate from this, their certainties are rather low, lower than 25%, meaning these deviations from the accepted phylogeny are not well supported. Furthermore, this tree was just the one with the maximum likelihood, meaning the branching order of this particular tree gives the highest average likelihood among all possible trees that can account for the data that was used. Bear in mind that with even just 10 species, there are over 34 million possible trees you can reconstruct. So finding the correct one isn't easy to say the least. But that's not all. Even if you determine the maximum likelihood tree, there often are still other possible trees with only a slightly lower likelihood. And indeed, Andrew et al. found 1,731 other trees for which the likelihoods aren't significantly different from that of the maximum likelihood tree. And these trees included the accepted phylogeny for these 10 mammals. In other words, the data from cytochrome B does not significantly support this discordant tree that LSS referenced in favor of the accepted phylogeny for these 10 mammals. For these and other reasons, Andrew et al. concluded, quote, only two groupings of species are clearly resolved by the cytochrome B data. These are the simian primates and the lorosoid strepsorine primates. The branching order of the other taxa, including Tarsius bencanus and Lemercata, cannot be determined from the data, close quote. Once again, completely refuting the claim that all genes should always show the same tree, and it blows the cytochrome B argument completely out of the water. It's quite telling that with a single exception that isn't actually discussed in the video, 
all of the video's academic sources were published prior to the year 2000, when Jonathan Wells' Icons of Evolution book was published. Indeed, the video is basically a heavily paraphrased reading of Chapter 4 of Wells' 20-year-old book, complete with the same citations. Now, to be fair, doing away with homology doesn't necessarily disprove Darwinism, but it is illustrative of the kind of lazy thinking that's common among many Darwinists. Bad arguments can simply get passed on uncritically. All homology proves is that scientists are just like everyone else, people, and we can be uncritical of things that we want to believe. This is very rich coming from creationists. Yes, creationists. Look up the Discovery Institute's wedge document. Creationist organizations are well known for their statement of faith, wherein they proclaim that they have presupposed their position as infallible and will automatically reject any evidence that contradicts it. In other words, they are uncritical of things they want to believe, and not just because they are simply people who can be uncritical by accident. These creationists are doing it on purpose with the goal to maintain their dogma by admission. It is therefore no surprise that creationists include professionals whose whole career is all about repeating and rehearsing the same canards that have been refuted a thousand times by the scientific community, and even once in a court of law. Speaking of those canards... But what about all the other lines of evidence? We've got biogeography, embryology, antibiotic resistance, whale evolution, even vestigial organs for crying out loud. Is this kind of lazy thinking when dealing with evidence for evolution a one-off mistake in biology, or is it more pervasive? That's a great question for another video. Oh goody, I can already hear him repeating the exact same flawed arguments. New World monkeys are in South America, which isn't expected according to evolution. Heckel's embryo drawings were faked. Antibiotic resistance isn't new information, it's just variation or loss of information. Resistance is also associated with a cost in fitness. Regarding whale evolution, he'll probably repeat some stuff from Jonathan Wells or perhaps Carl Warner's The Grand Experiment, such as Pachycetus didn't have a blowhole and was falsely depicted in the science magazine as an aquatic whale-like creature. It's just a terrestrial mammal, not a whale, yada yada yada. And vestigial organs are not useless, they are still functional. We have tackled some of these claims before, and not even that long ago in the two-part video A Critique of Intelligent Design. In fact, some of the claims in this video were also addressed back then. Of course, it is always possible that he will present something new, but we wouldn't count on it. So, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.